Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 315 of the FCPA Compliance Report. The FCPA Compliance Report is sponsored by Advanced Compliance Solutions, where I'm excited to announce a new service offering, which is a three-step process by which I help can help a compliance product or service provider get their name and products out into the marketplace. Step one is to work with you and your executive leadership team to develop a message. Step two is to sponsor my one-month series of podcasts that go out each month on a different compliance topic. And step three is to to work with your training and ongoing uh, sales team to support the message around compliance. If you'd like more information, please email me. Today I have back with me James Kukios. James is a fellow University of Michigan graduate, and we talk about the Morrison and Forrester monthly uh, global anti-corruption report that his firm puts out. We take a look at it for the month of January and highlight some of the various issues. The episode comes in at about 25 minutes. I think you will find this uh, episode very instructive. Thank you very much for listening. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. Welcome again for another episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. I am back with my U of M Law colleague, James Kukios, from the firm of um, MOFO in D.C., and he is here to talk about the January edition of the Top 10 International Anti-Corruption Development List uh, that he and his firm helped put out. So, James, welcome. Thanks, Tom. I have one minor correction for you. I'm a Michigan undergrad. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was a trader and went somewhere else for, for law school. I actually went to the Michigan of the East for law school, Harvard. So, Well, that's fair enough. Undergrad counts. <laughs> Go blue. Go blue. So the uh, really, if we could maybe just dive right into the, the 10 uh, items, and I guess, James, uh, really the overarching theme that I got from this was the continued global nature of anti-corruption enforcement. Uh, certainly there are FCPA cases on here, but it really speaks to what you did when you were in the department and what the department continues to do is not only investigate, but enforce on truly a global scale with cooperation for partners, both on investigation and enforcement. I think that's right, Tom. There's a really good uh, example that your readers are probably familiar with, the Rolls-Royce investigation, which involved uh, joint inv- or not joint parallel investigations Joint is a dirty word if you're a former prosecutor. You don't say joint parallel investigations uh, between the U.K., the U.S., and Brazil, and a coordinated resolution between all three of those jurisdictions, including DOJ giving credit to the company uh, in the United States for the fine that it paid to the Brazilian authorities. So just like we saw with Odebrecht the, the month before, we see another mega resolution involving multiple jurisdictions, multiple countries, uh, working together, pooling resources, sharing information, and coordinating resolutions. And certainly for Rolls-Royce, it seemed to me to be a, a very big feather in the cap of the Serious Fraud Office. And for those who had criticized the Serious Fraud Office and that it seriously was not serious, I think it answered a lot of those uh, criticisms. Absolutely. I mean, over the last couple of years, the Serious Fraud Office has, as you said, become much more serious. They've put together quite a track record of both corporate and individual prosecutions. Of course, they've lost a couple of cases here or there. Every good prosecutor's office does. Um, part of it was growing pains. And this was actually the largest corporate resolution ever in the UK for a criminal matter. So pretty impressive. It was also the third ever deferred prosecution agreement um, in the UK, which shows that uh, the serious fraud office is using that tool um, which was given to it a couple of years ago by UK legislation to pursue cases. Uh, and uh, that's a way for companies, just like they've been doing in the United States for quite a while, to resolve cases in the UK as well. So I put together a top 10 global anti-corruption uh, enforcement list, or at least a top 10 fines and penalties, and um, Rolls-Royce came in at number three. So really tr- shows the true global nature of anti-corruption enforcement uh, going forward. James, we had a couple of cases that uh, involved issues that we really don't see very often, or at least the issue of recidivism. And so I wanted to take some time to, to maybe talk to you about um, what is a recidivist, how the department re- 
views recidivism. If a client came to you in, in that fact pattern, could you still, uh, with the other uh, prongs of the pilot program, such as extensive cooperation and extensive remediation, uh, really uh, help the, that company, uh, even if it's a recidivist, receive a reduction in the fine and penalty? And really just hear your perspective on that. Sure. Well, obviously, recidivism is not a good fact. Uh, if you've been convicted, whether you're an individual or a corporation, if you've been convicted of a crime or uh, in the case of a corporation uh, entered into a resolution involving a crime uh, uh, and then are alleged to have committed the same type of crime later on, that's not going to be a good fact for you. That's a, obviously a negative factor when it comes to the, to the um, principles of federal prosecution of business organizations as well as of individuals. Um, so that's going to be a very challenging fact for you. It does not mean that the, the, the day is necessarily lost. There are still ways that you can try to mitigate. Obviously, number one is, is it just an allegation or did it actually happen? Um, but assuming that it actually did happen, um, there are still things you can do to try to mitigate that by cooperating, by uh, remediating uh, more fully, but obviously you, the deck is going to be a little bit stacked against you if you are accused of doing the same thing again. Uh, I think it's going to be particularly, for a lot of prosecutors and SEC enforcement attorneys, it's going to be particularly egregious because they may be the same ones who entered into the resolution with you uh, before, probably heard about your compliance program and all the remedial actions that you've taken and how it's not going to happen again, and then here they are again in the same situation. You know, there's a, there's sort of a personal matter. Sometimes I'm not accusing anybody of these cases uh, of acting improperly, but there's kind of a personal nature when, when you've been told that things are cleaned up and, and you should give the company a break or you should do this or that because it's a new day at the company and it comes back and there are these issues again. So it's clearly not going to be the, the ideal situation that you're going to want to have to be in if you're a corporation. But like you said, Tom, it, it's relatively rare that there actually are findings by the department or the commission of actual recidivism. So I think in uh, Biomet, as opposed to um, uh, Orthofix, we had new conduct. And I, my sense would be that would be treated much more severely than conduct which was not um, determined or discovered prior to the time of the um, resolution. So there could even be kind of uh, differences within the recidivism care, uh, category. and But if, if you do have new conduct, um, I have some experience in that. And uh, my experience is the department takes a very dim view of it. That's right. I, th so that's a good point, Tom. Sometimes there, there's a difference between recidivism and conduct that's old and is discovered after a resolution. Um, so, for example, a couple of years ago, I was involved in this case, um, Marabini, uh, where Marabini had resolved as part of the big TSKJ resolution um, the charges in that case. And then subsequent to that, it was discovered that um, Marabini had conspired with Alstom to pay bribes in Indonesia for a power plant. Uh, now, this wasn't true recidivist conduct because the, the conduct actually took place before DOJ uh, entered into a resolution with Marabini. Uh, it was just later discovered because it was discovered as part of the Alstom investigation, not as part of the TSKJ investigation. So that's not true recidivism. Now, in that case, the company decided they had, they had sort of had a compliance monitor, they had done a DPA, um, and they felt like they didn't want to go through that again, so they ended up pleading guilty. Um, but with some other companies, that may not be exactly the case. I think in, in your uh, situation, Tom, the, the company also decided to plead guilty, but that was uh, additional conduct. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Um, so we have the, the two different cases here. As you mentioned, uh, the Zimmer Biomet case was actually new conduct. Uh, and it's rare not only that there was a, uh, a second corporate resolution with essentially the same company. There had been a, a merger there. So it was entirely the same company, but it was very much the same company. But that, um, that re second resolution also re uh, involved a second monitor requirement. And I think that's pretty unusual. We, I, don't, I don't recall any other situations where we've seen not only a second resolution, which is rare in itself, but a second monitor requirement, which is extremely rare.
Well, in the company that I was involved with, Able, uh, at one point there was a proposal of an extension of the monitor uh, by an equal number of years from the prior, from the initial term of the monitor, and then a substantial additional penalty. And that's when the company decided to uh, just go ahead and plead guilty. Right, and 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 we had uh, in the Alcatel case too back in. Um, uh, was it 2014? The three-year deferred prosecution agreement, which came with a monitor, was also extended for a time uh, because of that as well. They did not end up pleading guilty. They agreed to the um, the extension of the monitor's term. So there are there are ways uh, cases are resolved differently. Uh, to go back to your original question, Tom, uh, it's not always going to result in in the same. It's not always going to be the same result if there's additional conduct found. Um, there's some ways to deal with it as a company. And in the Alcatel case back in 2014, not only did Alcatel agree to um, retain the independent compliance monitor, but they'd also made what DOJ characterized as an unprecedented pledge to cease using third-party agents and conducting its <laughs> worldwide business. So that's another <laughs> another thing that they did that sort of uh, did not result in a, in a um, uh, violation of the DPA, but an extension of the DPA. Right. James, we had, a, I thought, a very interesting case involving the company now called Mondelez. Uh, its predecessor is probably more familiar to our listeners, Kraft Foods, and their <clears throat> acquisition of Cadbury, and particularly Cadbury's uh, Indian operations. And this, I thought, was um, it was interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, it uh, really followed the uh, Oracle SEC enforcement action from 2012. This was not a Department of Justice criminal action, so it was a civil side action. But it really pointed to me, uh, pointed to me the need for, and really what the DOJ, you, and others have been preaching for a long time is the mergers and acquisition component of a best practices compliance program requires both a robust pre-acquisition uh, due diligence, risk assessment, and effort, in addition to what we typically see post-acquisition with integration, a forensic audit, training, and those sorts of things. So I was wondering maybe what your thoughts might be on the importance of pre-acquisition in the due diligence, or excuse me, the M&A process. Sure, of course. Uh, pre-acquisition uh, M&A due, due diligence is critical. Um, the the most extreme scenario is uh, the acquiring company may find that the acquired company or target company is so fundamentally tainted by um, corruption that its business is essentially worthless and can walk away from it. For example, one of my first cases at the department uh, was the Latinode case. Uh, and in that case, um, that's the prime Elandia, right. Yeah. Elandia, which was a, uh, a telecom company based in Miami uh, acquired another, other smaller telecom company based in Miami that had focused on uh, mostly the Latin American market, as you can uh, infer from its name, but some others as well, uh, did not realize that sort of the crown jewel of its uh, assets of uh, or its array of contracts with Honditel, the Honduran state-owned telecom company, uh, had involved quite a bit of bribery. Uh, there are some allegations that uh, it was procured through bribery, but what was really shown in, in emails and really quite laid out in the charging document, if I don't say so myself, uh, was that there were subsequent bribes paid to keep that contract and to lower the prices to make it more lucrative and to be able to uh, allow Latino to compete on a, on a better basis against its competitors. Uh, and when Elandia found out about this post-acquisition, uh, they determined that essentially Latinode was worthless and they wrote off their entire acquisition costs. Now that didn't quite happen in, in the uh, Cadbury Mondelez um, uh, acquisition. Obviously Cadbury is a much bigger company. It wasn't dependent as dependent on one contract and the, and the facts were not as egregious. Uh, but it, it appears from, from the SEC's papers that uh, unfortunately for Mondelez, they were a little bit limited in the pre-acquisition uh, due diligence they could do, which is reminiscent of the Halliburton um, uh, opinion procedure release back at 08, number 0802, where Halliburton was trying to acquire a, a UK-based company and the laws there made it difficult to do complete pre-acquisition due diligence. And what happened was right about the time, according to the SEC's papers, right about the time that Mondelez, then Kraft, was um, trying to acquire Cadbury, Cadbury had 
retained an agent to help it get the permits and things necessary to expand one of its facilities to make chocolate. Uh, and then right about the time of the acquisition is when the agent started doing uh, his or her work and ended up submitting what the SEC alleged to be five bogus invoices for work that uh, he did not do, which was allegedly, I think, although not brought out, it's, there's no allegations of actual bribery, but the, the concern and the implication was those payments may have been used for bribery and therefore amounted to a violation of the uh, FCPA's accounting provisions. So it's, a, it's, a interesting, it's an interesting opinion. The, it, it appears to invoke successor liability, but, it, but it's not 100% clear on there because the agent was retained and therefore the due diligence not performed and things like that pre-acquisition by Cadbury, which was an issuer. Uh, and then the payments were actually submitted post-acquisition uh, after Mondelez acquired Cadbury. And it appears that Cadbury canceled its, its registration in the U.S., but uh, that did not go into effect for a couple, of ye- uh, couple months. Um, so it's not entirely clear if this was uh, successor liability purely, post-acquisition uh, misconduct purely, or a mix of the both. Either way, Tom, exactly as you say, one of the most important things about pre-acquisition due diligence is – to know what problems you have when you buy the company so you can immediately start to uh, remediate. You know, if, if in another world, if Mondelez had been, had a chance to do maybe some, some more due diligence and found out more about this agent, maybe it could have uh, canceled the contract with that agent right away and avoided these five payments from being made. And James, uh, really to end up our session today, I wanted to visit about some of the very interesting individual guilty pleas uh, under the FCPA that came up in January, particularly around um, our good friends down in Venezuela, Petavesa. Sure, sure, Tom. So yes, this is a, a long-going case. <clears throat> it's the eighth and ninth guilty pleas that have that have happened. The allegations are that uh, various executives in the United States. Um, bribed the procurement executives uh, and other executives at PDVSA, which is a state-owned oil company of Venezuela. Uh, the PDVSA is an acronym for Petróleos de Venezuela SA, uh, in order to get various benefits, including being able to bid for uh, PDVSA contracts and to kind of get status on the bidding lists. Uh, I think it's a very important investigation for many reasons. And, and the, the number one reason, I think, is um, it's one of those cases that did not involve uh, corporate cooperation. You know, one of the one of the criticisms of the FCPA over the year is that all the FCPA prosecutors and enforcement attorneys do is let is is let companies go out there and do investigations and uh, just ride the coattails there. Uh, this is one of those cases, though, where it's good old fashioned police work. If you read the papers, you can see that there was a, a lot of following the money, uh, which presumably was done through various um, subpoenas for financial transactions and things like that, uh, flipping witnesses to get them to tell them about this. And it has really led to quite a few people uh, pleading guilty in in connection to this, nine so far, and according to the DOJ press release, the investigation is ongoing. Uh, This, of course, uh, you can read between the lines from the the documents, started pre-Yates memo, and so shows the government's long-standing DOJ and SEC as well. This is the DOJ resolution, but the long-standing emphasis on getting individual bribe payers. And even though FCPA cases can be extremely difficult to investigate and prosecute because of the international nature of the transactions, uh, this is one of those cases where DOJ and its uh, law enforcement partners were really able to just use old-fashioned police work to get uh, to some really... uh, long-standing and widespread bribe payments involving the Venezuelan uh, state-owned oil company. Well, James, unfortunately, we're at the end of our time, but I wanted to ask if uh, anyone wanted to follow up uh, with you on any of the cases we talked about, or indeed the Morrison and Forster Top 10 International uh, Anti-Corruption Developments for January 2017 newsletter, could they email you? And if so, how would they do it? Uh, Of course, would welcome the contact. My email is jkoukios, J-K-O-U-K-I-O-S, at mofo.com. We also, on our website, have an FCPA page, and you can get all our publications there with a link. 
So I'm going to link to your um, uh, the newsletter in the uh, show notes, and I would just uh, remind the audience that this is a, a fabulous we- uh, resource, and the website is a fabulous resource for the compliance practitioner. It's got a lot of great stuff, and I would encourage you to check it out because I do. So James, as always, thanks, and I look forward to visiting with you uh, on the next month. Sounds great, Tom. Go Blue. Go Blue. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. If you listen to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate us as it would help in our rankings and help us get the word out about this podcast to the greater compliance community. Also, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. This is Tom Fox. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and I hope you will join me for the next episode of the FCPA Compliance Report.